All right, assalamu alaikum. So let's get started. Uh, today will be our sixth and final lecture on the spark of life. Uh, this will be the last lecture in which we will discuss the role of electricity uh, in the human body. And the nice thing about today's lecture is that I will build up to something that you're already familiar with. And you've come across this, I, I'm sure, uh, in, in your own lives or in the lives of your loved ones. And that is clinical diagnostics using ECG. Now, this is a very vast field. The electrocardiogram and electri electrocardiography is a very vast field. There have been volumes of volumes written upon this and millions of people in the world have undergone an ECG uh, diagnosis. And it's a vital tool for looking at cardiovascular disease. But today in 30, 40 minutes, I'm just trying to give you an overview of where is the signal coming from. And the ECG is one of the many electrical signals that originate from the human body. For example, you could look at electrical activity in the brain uh, and the signal is generally called an EEG, an electroencephalogram. You could also look at uh, uh, the electrical signal from muscle twitching, muscle movements, electromyography. You could also look at the peripheral nervous system, electroneurography. You could also look at the ECG of, uh, uh, an, em of an embryo or a fetus uh, inside the mother's womb. You could do fetal electrocardiography. Uh, you could also look at electrical signals that generate inside the eye through electroretinograms. So there are many sources of electrical signals inside uh, the human body. And we can look at these signals mostly in a non-destructive manner, which means that we can put electrodes on our skin at various locations on our skin and pick up these signals that are coming from inside the human body. Unless you are in an intensive care unit or a patient is in the intensive care unit uh, where one needs to introduce electrodes into the human body. Most of this diagnostics is done non-invasively by putting electrodes on the outer surface. Now, how is it possible that you put something on the outer surface of your body, your torso, and you get a signal that is coming from deep inside? And these signals are generally extremely weak. So they are prone to noise. They are prone to interference. You have to amplify them. There are artifacts, for example, if the body moves, the electrical signal also moves and that can hide the signal of interest. So it's a very vast field and a whole field of signal processing based on machine learning and artificial intelligence has also spurred, has also come into existence which uses modern informatics tools to look at these signals. And in the class today, I'm giving you, I will give you a practical demonstration of, of one of these signals in a very simple fashion. So before we start uh, and we talk about the ECG, I would just like to introduce to you the electrical system of the heart. All right. So I hope you can all see this. So this is one view of the heart. The heart is made up of cells, generally called myocytes. These are muscular cells. So far, we've looked at action potentials inside neurons, and hence nerves. Nerves are bundles of neurons. But these muscular scale cells can also sustain an action potential. They can also be excited. There's also a resting potential inside these cells, and the phenomenon of action potential by the opening and closing of voltage gated channels across the myocytic cell membrane can be produced. So what happens inside the cell is that this heart pumps. The atria contract, they push blood into the ventricles. And then after a certain time delay, the ventricles contract and they push blood either into the aorta, the systemic circulation part or the pulmonary circulation part. So these muscle cells are contracting, but who tells them to contract? 
It's a signal which is of electrical origin. It's the action potential in the myocytes, in the muscle cells of the heart that tell a particular cell or a tissue to contract. So there is an entire electrical conduction system, a pathway, a circuit inside uh, the heart. So it all starts from, from this collection of myocytes, cells, which is called in, uh, in, in a colloquial language, it's called the pacemaker. And technically it's called the sinoatrial node. Now this sinoatrial node does not have any resting potential. It's, it sustains an action potential of this kind, right? It goes up, down, up, down, and it does th this autorhythmically on its own, all right? And it's not controlled by the nervous system. The nervous system can control its speed, but it just does it on its own. So if you take the heart out of the human body and put it, give it oxygen, it can still pump without the influence of the brain. That's what happens in a bypass surgery. The heart is put on uh, a bypass. So what this uh, collection of cells does, it generates an action potential, which is of this kind. This action potential, of course, is a set of depolarization followed by polarization again, depolarization followed by polarization. So this depolarization produces an electric field. And I'll show you how it produces an electric field later. But this electrical stimulus then travels to the cardiomyocytes. It travels to the atrial muscle, number two. And it tells when it reaches the atrial muscle, an action potential is sustained in the atrial muscle, which is shown by this triangular wedge-shaped uh, signal. And it tells the atria to contract, both the left and the right. And when the atria contract, of course, they put blood into the ventricles through these uh, semilunar valves. And at the same time, the electrical impulse, which is in the form of an electric field, I'll show you how this pulse is transmitted from cell to cell. It reaches number three, which is another, which is the outpost of uh, a, a fibrous, uh, of, of this two branched structure of cells. And this point is called the atrioventricular node because it rests at the junction of the atria and the ventricles. So when the signal reaches the atrioventricular or the AV node, it also produces its action potential. And then the signal travels along this fiber. This part is called the His bundle. When it reaches the His bundle, and all of this is propagating at a certain speed, which is finite. The speed or the time interval in going from one to three to four could be of the order of tens to hundreds of milliseconds. Okay, so that blood has sufficient time to move from the atria to the ventricles. Remember that this has to be accompanied by the contraction of muscles, which is a slow process, which requires mechanical fluid going from one chamber to another. That's a slow process. The electrical signals can travel much faster. So everything has to be synchronized in time in such a manner that the ventricles pump after the atria. If, the, if no blood exists in the ventricles, it's meaningless whether the ventricle pump pumped or not. So once the signal reaches the His bundle, it branches off into two parts, which are called the Purkinje fibers. And then they, these fibers are spread out into, into, in this wall, the septum, as well as the ventricular muscle. And the signal finally goes to the ventricular muscle. And when it reaches the ventricular muscle, this is what the action potential looks like. Very familiar to the action potential in the nerves that we've seen already. And finally, finally, this action potential inside the heart, covered by tissue inside the torso, uh, is able to reach the outer skin. The human body is a conductor, a good conductor of electricity. That's why we get electrocuted. If you place electrodes at vantage points on the human body, on the torso or the chest, the arms, the limbs and the legs, and we place them uh, in a systematic fashion, we are able to get a signal which resembles, which is called the ECG, the electrocardiogram. And depending upon where you place these electrodes, 
you will get a typical ECG waveform. So the purpose of today's lecture is to give you an idea of how this ECG trace is built. So don't ask me more questions about the anatomy, but uh, uh, I'm also as, as layman as you are in, most of you are in this, but this is the physics that I would like to highlight. And this is the underlying biophysical structure that is generating the ECG waveform. Any questions about this? So the ECG is an electrical signal. It's in self a vital, and it can help. It can tell you about the heart rate. It can tell you about whether a particular muscle is damaged or not, whether the pacemaker is dead or not, whether there is some rhythmic disease, there is some aperiodicity. It can tell you whether this wave here T exists or not, whether it is depressed or elevated. It can tell you if you are getting this proper QRS, uh, waveform, which is indicative of ventricular contraction. It can tell you about atrial flutter. It can tell you about ventricular fibrillations. It can tell you about the onset of heart disease. It can tell you whether you've already had a heart disease. It can tell you about congenital heart disease and so on. So it's, it provides a body of knowledge about the brain and the cardiovascular system. And by looking at, so doctors, clinicians spent lifetimes on understanding this ECG and what changes in a normal ECG would appear which indicate a particular malady, a particular disease. So any question, more questions about this? So we move on to the physics part. So what I want to start off by uh, today is showing how this action potential is generated a brief overview of how the voltage gated channels open and close to generate this action potential inside the ventricular muscle. And we've already seen this for nerves, so the discussion will be really simple. The only difference, marked difference that we see for the heart is that the role of calcium becomes really important. So far, we haven't talked much about calcium. We've talked mostly about sodium channel transport. We've talked about potassium channel transport. We've talked about sodium potassium pumps. But in the heart, the calcium is really important because it's the calcium inside the cell, muscular cell, the myocyte that makes the cell to contract and hence the tissue to contract and pump blood out. All right, so let's move on to that part of the discussion. Now, can you turn on the lights, please? <clears throat> All right, so <clears throat> so if you look at these, if I just represent the sinoatrial node by a cell here, the sinoatrial node, it's in fact a collection of cells. And then these are the myocytes. These are the cells that make up the cardiac tissue, the myocytes. So an action potential is transmitting from propagating from the sinoatrial node to the myocytes. And so it's moving along the heart tissue in a particular direction. It's spreading out as well. So it's not a lateral motion in one direction. It's spreading out and it depends upon the anatomy of the heart and how this spreads out. Now there are gaps between these cells, which are called gap junctions. So the sinoatrial node autorhythmically produces an action potential, right? <coughs> and this action potential <coughs> lets certain ions to diffuse into this uh, into these myocytes. So I'm going to explain which, which, which ions are those. But let's start our focus on, on, the, on these myocytes. Particularly, we're going to focus on the ventricular muscle cells and see how that action potential is created. So if I were to create a model of a cell inside 
the ventricum ventricle this is the cell membrane and we have different kinds of voltage gated channels so this is the cell membrane this is the extracellular part and this is the intracellular part all right so we have so simplistically let's draw a sodium channel voltage gated this is my sodium channel this is my calcium channel we haven't this is the first time we've seen the calcium channel right It becomes important for the cardiac process and finally we have the potassium channel and all three of these channels are voltage controlled they are voltage gated just as we've discussed in the hodgkin huxley model now if i were to plot the action potential with time this is my action potential and i'm plotting the potential inside the cell versus outside in the resting state there is a resting state for these cells and generally for the heart it's about minus 90 millivolts and once again inside the cell we have a high concentration of potassium and outside the cell we have a high concentration of sodium and a high concentration of calcium ions and they develop this nurse potential and all of those nurse potentials are weighted by the permeability of these channels and they give us the resting potential of minus 90 millivolts roughly inside the cell now when <clears throat> what happens is when this cell is triggered when it is excited say some current flows in by neighboring ions coming in from a neighboring cell this potential tends to go up because it is really calcium and sodium ions from a neighboring cells that are diffusing into the cell at a particular voltage say of about minus 70 millivolts so this is my resting potential i start off with my resting potential ions diffuse in so this is the region where ions diffuse into the cell positive ions mostly sodium and calcium from neighboring cells diffuse into the cell all right and they increase the voltage inside the cell when it reaches 70 millivolts this sodium voltage gated channel opens and sodium ions rush in and they further increase this potential and make it go upwards at a very rapid pace this is a fast gate fast acting channel so the ingress of the sodium ions makes this potential go up at a rapid pace and this entire phase is therefore called depolarization right we've already seen that in our discussion of the action potential this is called the rapid depolarization phase so sodium gate will open when this potential crosses the threshold of minus 70 millivolts hence this gate is voltage controlled and when the potential rises further and when it reaches about minus 40 millivolts the calcium voltage gate, gate voltage control gates this snap open and calcium ions come in so there is a very rapid ingress of calcium ions and you get a high population of sodium ions and potassium and calcium ions inside the cell potassium ions are already inside the cell so this potential rises even further okay so at some point it reaches about some positive value say 20 to 30 millivolts let's say 30 millivolts and at this point Uh, this cell would now have a large number of sodium ions a large number of calcium ions because they've come in in the depolarization phase and at this point when this voltage this upper voltage is reached plus 30 millivolts 
when the inside of the cell has become more positive than the outside by about 30 millivolts, the sodium gate closes. This closes, this snaps shut. But the calcium gate remains open because the calcium gate is a slow acting gate. The sodium gate is fast, the calcium channel is slow. So the sodium gate, so at this point, okay, let me label this curve. At this point, this is, let's call this state A, B, C. A is the resting potential. B is opening of the fast sodium gate. C is opening of the fast, of the slow, sorry, calcium gate. Calcium channel. But when the sodium gate at this point, it just snaps shut. The calcium gate remains open. And now sodium gate, sodium ions are prevented from coming into the cell because the sodium gate has shut. And when it shuts, the potential goes slightly downwards because no more sodium ions can come in. So at this point D, this is the point where the sodium gate closes. And this part of rapid depolarization occurs of the order, in the order of, a, of some milliseconds, very fast. But then the potential comes down a little bit. The calcium ions are still coming in. And at some point E, the potassium channel opens. And when the potassium channel opens, the potassium ions can go out of the cell. And when potassium ions go out of the cell, it tries to repolarize the cell, which means the inside of the cell tries to become negative. However, now we have a competing scenario. Calcium ions are coming in, bringing in positive charge, and potassium ions are going out, uh, making the inside more negative. And there's a kind of a dynamic equilibrium, which means that you get an isoelectronic phase in which the potential remains constant because there is no net transfer of charge across the cell. And this period generally lasts for about 200 to 300 milliseconds. And that's why the calcium uh, channel is a slow channel. At some point, finally, the calcium gate closes, the potassium gate remains open, and the resting potential is restored. And here, the potassium gate also closes. All right, so this is a reproduction or a fair description of how that particular waveform of the action potential <clears throat> inside the ventricular muscle is achieved. This phase here is called, for obvious reasons, depolarization. And this phase here is called repolarization. That's when the cell is repolarized towards its resting potential. And in this region here, this region, which I'm now shading in blue, is the region where calcium ions are coming in, potassium ions are going out, but there is a high concentration of calcium ions inside the cell. And this calcium ion allows this cell to contract. But still the Remember that in the resting state, the, there's a huge difference, population difference in calcium ions outside and inside. There's very few calcium ions inside, many orders of magnitude difference. So any calcium ions that come in cause a marked increase in, 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 in so the polarization changes very rapidly. It can be sensed very rapidly. In fact, there's another mechanism inside the cell which allows extra calcium to be released inside the cell. 
all right so extra calcium that is already present inside the cell in the form of sarcoplasmic reticulum is released so this is calcium gated release of extra calcium already present inside the cell and when this extra calcium when there's a bombardment of this extra calcium in the cell the cell contracts and when all of these cells contract in tandem the muscle contracts and when the muscle contracts it enables the flow of blood it pushes out the blood so this entire region is the region of muscular contraction as well so this is a parsing of the action potential inside a cardiac myocyte any questions g well it just since calcium uh, the calcium channel closes the potassium channel closes in such a fashion that you do not overshoot it's because of the timing of these voltage gated channels now all of this lasts for a longer period of time 200 300 milliseconds and this allows sufficient time for the ventricles to contract remember that the ventricles have to pump around 5 liters of blood in a minute all right so it's this has to be all orchestrated and timed in a in a particular fashion any questions now what we would like to understand is how does this generate a signal that is detected on the outer surface of the skin the answer lies in a concept which is called the electric dipole the main idea is that the heart is an electric dipole okay and i'm going to explain what this means in the next 15 20 minutes i'm going to explain what this means so the key idea is that the heart is an electric dipole and we need to know what is an electric dipole and what kind of dipole is a heart so this is where the physics explains the biology where the physics explains the human body now you can understand everything without recourse to physics but i think having the physics in front of you illuminates the physics the biological process as well excuse me now suppose i have a charge plus q and starting off with the idea of a charge now i am at a certain location a certain distance x from this charge there will be an electric field at this point so the electric field at this point you might know from basic a level physics or your electricity and magnetism class if you've already taken that is the electric field let's call this point p so oh, let's use another let's call this point x e at x is some constant k this particular charge over x square this is an electric field and it has a certain direction as well if this is a positive charge the electric field is pointing away from the charge now if i have some test charge q prime some test charge which is hypothetical and which i place at this point and i would like to move it towards this source charge i would have to apply a certain force suppose this test charge is also positive so force i know that i have to apply at x is equal to the amount of this charge multiplied by the electric field because force is that's how we define electric fields force per unit charge so i take this k multiplied with q prime and i get x this is the force that i need to put on this charge so that i can bring it slightly closer to this source charge now if i were to 
bring this test charge from far away, from far, 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 far away, really far away, so that there is no electric field here. And I slowly bring it closer and closer and closer and closer in a quasi static fashion to the point X. I will have to apply a force at each point. Force, 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 which means I have to do some work. Okay. Work means that I'm increasing the potential energy of my test charge. So when I do work on something, I'm increasing its energy, its potential energy. So the total energy that I have to supply in bringing a test charge from far away, which I represent as infinity to the point X is given by the sum of these forces. Suppose the forces are all in the same direction. I'm bringing this charge in a straight line. Doesn't really matter, but for the sake of this discussion, let's bring this in a straight line. So what I need to do is uh, I need to <clears throat> apply, apply these forces one by one, one by one. So what happens is, what is the energy and how is energy and force related? I have to multiply this force by distance. So what I need to do is K, Q, Q prime over X square. This is the force at some X. And I need to multiply it by the small amount of motion that I do. And then I bring this X from infinity to my final X. Let's call this final X R. Let's call this R. So this is the work that I need to do, correct? Now, if I divide, now Q is my source charge. I know what my source charge is. But Q dash is just a figment of my imagination. It's a test charge. If the test charge changes, the potential energy changes. But what I would really like to do is I would like to have a formula that is independent of the size of my test charge, right? So that I can make comparisons. So I divide this by the test charge. And the thing that remains is, which is U over Q prime is called the potential. So I divide this by the, uh, and I, so what I eventually left off with is KQ infinity to R dx over x square. So this will be my potential at the point R with respect to the potential at infinity. All right. Any questions? Okay. Okay. So this will be the potential. So I find out the potential energy increase that is entailed in moving a charge from far away to some point, some distance R. And then I divide it by the amount of test charge. I get the potential at this point electric potential at this point. So when I do this, the integral of one over X squared is minus one over X minus one over X. And I put in the limits, I get minus KQR one over infinity zero. So the potential at some distance R from a test charge is minus KQ over R. So by a point charge or by some point charge, I, I would know that it will have some potential everywhere, right? Its effect is going to be felt everywhere. And whenever there is a potential, there is an electric field. The electric field is just the gradient of the potential. Now, this is a point charge, a single charge. How is it different from a dipole? So what's a di does anyone know what a dipole is? And the heart is a dipole. So any idea what a dipole is? Exactly, two point charges, which are equal and opposite. So if I were to replace, 
I have a plus Q charge and a minus Q charge separated by a distance small d. And then I draw a hypothetical line. And this is a point at some distance, say R. Will there be a potential here? Remember, if you look at the formula over here, look at this formula. If I change the sign of Q, this potential is going to reverse. Remember, remember this. Now here, I have two charges, equal and opposite, but they are separated by some distance. This object here is called an electric dipole. And the heart acts as an electric dipole, as we're going to see in a minute. Now, when this, my, so my question is, now I have a point X far away, and this R is much larger than D. G, question? So if this R is much larger than D, will there be some potential here? Yes, there's going to be some potential. Let's find out what that potential is. So at this point, there's potential due to this charge and potential due to this charge. So if I find my potential at X, I get K, Q over, now the distance of this point is R minus D minus K. This charge is now minus Q over R. So this would become K Q one over R minus one over R minus D. So I can just do some clever tricks, R, R minus D, R minus D minus plus D. So KQ one over R minus D over R, correct? just do some algebraic manipulation. So I come here, I bring this thing here, KQ R, sorry, sorry, KQ over R, sorry, right? Sorry, sorry, R is divided. So there's R here. So I get, I do have an R. So this becomes KQ over R. And I bring this denominator up into the numerator, one minus D over R. Now this D is much smaller than R. So I can use the binomial expansion. KQ over R one plus D over R plus higher order terms. So I do get a, a potential. I do get a potential due to this, due to this dipole. So this is KQ one over R, R minus D. 
so r minus d plus d so r so i get k q or r minus d so this is k q over r 1 minus d over r अ uh, डी कहीं और आना चाहिए ऊपर क्या मैंने गलत आर वो यहां पे आर माइनस डी सॉरी यार सॉरी आई एम सॉरी सॉरी आर माइनस डी बट आई एम सो सॉरी सो सॉरी so <clears throat> this is kq minus kqd r r minus d right is this correct minus kqd right so <clears throat> b r square 1 minus d over r this becomes minus k q d over r square 1 minus d over r minus 1 this becomes minus k q d over r square 1 plus d over r this becomes Minus k q d over r square minus k q d square over r cube plus some higher order terms. Got it? So this term here is the lowest order term in the potential at the point x. Now q is one charge and d is the separation between the two charges inside the dipole. this is defined if you take the product of the charge and the distance between the two charges in the dipole this is called the electric dipole moment and i define this as p is r is q times the distance this is called the electric dipole moment so the potential at the point x due to the electric dipole moment at a distance x is given by minus k p over the square of the distance between the electric dipole and the point of interest now if you compare this potential this formula this formula here with the formula that we have for a single cell a single charge how do the two formulas compare what is the dependence here on the distance from the charge it's a 1 over r dependence and the electric field is 1 over r squared so if i take the derivative of this potential kq over r i will get this formula here so the electric field is the derivative of the potential got it now here this is the potential and if i were to find out the electric field at the point x due to the dipole i will get kp some factor 2 over 3 r cube to lowest order so the electric field has one over r cube dependence in electric dipole so if i were to make a plot if this were my r and this were my strength of the electric field if i had a point charge the dependence is one over r square and for a dipole 
the dependence is one over R cube. Now, why am I doing this? I'm doing this because of two reasons. The first reason is that if I can generate an electric dipole, far away from that electric dipole, there is going to be a potential. And far away from the electric dipole, there is going to be an electric field. If the heart is a dipole, which I'm going to show how it is a dipole, it's going to produce an electric field far away. And why am I considering an electric field in addition to the potential? Because the electric field is a vector. Remember this, the electric field is a vector. So this must have a vectorial sign on top of it, which means that this electric dipole moment must also be a vector. Right? So if this is a vector, there has to be a vector here as well. So the electric dipole moment is a vector. And how do we define the direction of this electric dipole moment? P is a vector, is given by the amount of charge Q, and D becomes a vector. And what is D? If I have a negative charge and a positive charge, then if I draw an arrow from the negative charge to the positive charge, that arrow will be in the direction of the electric dipole moment. So I define my displacement vector from the negative charge to the positive charge. That's how I come up with a consistent definition. And if you look at the example over here, can you tell me what direction is the electric field pointing in at this point X for this particular configuration, left or right? Right, why? Because the positive charge is closer to the point X. The positive charge produces a field that points away from the positive charge. So the electric field is pointing to the right and so is the electric dipole moment pointing from the negative charge to the positive charge. Got it? Now, how does the heart act like an electric dipole? That's the next question. How on earth is the heart like an electric dipole? That's the question. Next five minutes on this question. Any questions from your end? Suppose I draw a myocyte, a single cell, just one cell. Now in the resting state, the inside of this cell is negative in the polarized state. The outside is positive. Now, at each point, there is an electric dipole moment, right? Separation of positive negative charge means electric. So there's a dipole moment here, upward, 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 downward, 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 rightward, rightward, upward, upward, leftward, leftward, leftward. Now, all of these are vectors, roughly the same magnitude. And when you add these vectors, what would be the resultant? When you add vectors pointing in all these directions, what would the resultant look like? Zero, right? You have vector pointing to the left, but on the right, they both resultant is zero. Up, down, resultant is zero. So this cell in its polarized state is, does not have an electric dipole moment. So polarized, the electric dipole moment is zero.
Now let's move to that part of the blackboard. I'm so sorry, I forgot to. So sorry, I forgot to change the screen. So this is what we've been discussing so far. So anyway, I'm sorry about that. Can you take a photograph of this blackboard, please? And send it to me later. I have to cater for the students who don't come to class. Now we're going to move on from here and we try to depolarize this cell, right? So when the action potential is excited in this cell, some part of it is going to get depolarized. Let's see what happens to the electric dipole moment then. So I redraw this, the same cell. So, so suppose the depolarization, the onset of depolarization is from the left part of this cell. So here, the right part of this cell, cell is still in the polarized state, but there has been some excitation. The action potential is being produced and this part gets depolarized. So the inside gets positive and the outside gets negative. And of course, this is happening at a certain time scale. The action potential is not instantaneous. It happens at a certain time scale. Now let's draw the dipole moments in different parts, upward, 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 downward, 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 downward. Right, right. Right, 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 right. Inward, 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 inward. All right. Now, if you take the resultant of all of these vectors, will the electric dipole moment of this cell, macroscopic dipole moment. Now, instead of talking about these small electric dipole moments, I place an electrode here on the outer skin. So this is my skin here. And I place an electrode, right? Which can pick up voltages and far away, outside my skin. Now, with this electrode, first question is, will there be a resultant electric dipole moment? What direction would it be? Left, K, right. To the right. So the electric dipole moment, this cell will have an electric dipole moment P to the right. And this electric dipole moment is going to produce a potential here. Just in the manner that we've, we've uh, seen over, seen there, right? An electric dipole moment is producing an electric field at a certain distance. Okay. So now this region is depolarized. This is the polarized region. And if an electric field is here, a potential can be seen here. And as the cell progresses From this configuration, the resting state configuration, the polarized state configuration, there is a sweep of depolarization. As we see over here, the action potential is initiated here and it moves to the right. It propagates to the right. This electrode is going to see a potential. <clears throat> and since the depolarizing wave is moving towards the electrode, if I were to connect this to an oscilloscope or a device that measures voltage with a reference to some other electrode that is far away at zero potential, initially it was at rest, no potential because the electric dipole moment was zero and suddenly it sees a rise in the potential. Now, if I could make successive diagrams of this configuration in which I represent the depolarizing part in blue. At this point, A, suppose I have this waveform at this electrode. At some other point, 
the depolarizing part advances further this is where i would have reached a maximum in the potential the electric dipole moment is maximum so this is my point b b and when the wave of depolarization advances even further let's see what the charges look like here negative 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 positive 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 now if i were to draw the electric dipole moments right 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 up down 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 up will there still be an electric dipole moment now the electric dipole moment is towards the left uh oh i'm sorry i'm so sorry i'm so sorry i'm so sorry <clears throat> so still it's going up still it's going up i haven't reached the point b the point c the, the point b that i would like to really show is when all of it becomes depolarized right so this is still some c point in between now i'm going to show the point b what happens at point b when the entire cell is depolarized when the entire cell is depolarized i have positive positive everywhere now what direction is the electric dipole moment pointing in uh it's again zero the electric dipole moment has again become zero so what happens here is that this point comes down so first so if you have an electrode and a depolarization wave is approaching the electrode then you see a positive change in the voltage if a repolarization wave is approaching the electrode you see a dropping voltage all right and if i were to place an electrode over here this electrode will register a potential that is in fact the inverse of this so the key is that if a depolarization wave approaches an electrode the electric dipole moment vector is facing the electrode is pointing in the direction of the electrode it's towards the electrode it gives rise to an increasing potential and when the depolarization wave is moving away from the electrode it gives rise to a negative potential so from this polarization depolarization picture you can actually determine so if you have a model of the heart initially all of it is polarized no electric dipole moment vector and if i place an electrode here on the chest uh, there will be no signal it will be in the resting state isoelectronic state no potential difference now if a wave of depolarization is setting in from the sinoatrial node towards the atrioventricular node there is going to be an electric dipole moment pointing in this direction this is the electrical dipole moment of the entire heart just as the electrical dipole moment that we have over here as this wave front of depolarization advances inside the heart it might change its course because of the anatomical structure of the heart this electrical dipole moment vector is now going to point in another direction 
And when all of it is eventually depolarized, it's going to point in another direction. And at the same time, the onset of repolarization starts towards the top left of the heart. The top left of the heart starts to repolarize again. So eventually this electric dipole moment exists for the entire heart. The entire heart will act like a macroscopic electric dipole moment, which is changing its direction during the action potentials, which is changing its direction during the cardiac cycle. And it's not only changing its direction, it's also changing its magnitude. Yes, please. <clears throat> so, just a minute, please. So, suppose I have my cell is like this. Uh, positive, completely depolarized. This means there is no electric dipole moment. When this is the case, I will have reached this point C. In order for an electric dipole moment to exist, there has to be some discontinuity between the positive and the negative charge. That's how we define electric dipole moment. So this point here, completely depolarized state, corresponds to the potential becoming, uh, becoming zero again. Now suppose after this state has been achieved, you have to repolarize the cell. So what happens after this? Let's see. What happens after this is that this back end of the cell becomes polarized again. Now let's see what happens there. This end becomes repolarized. Here, you still have the cell in the depolarized state. Now you have an electric dipole moment pointing in the opposite direction, right? Now, as this repolarization advances to the right and you have an electrode here, you have a depolarization, a polarization wave approaching this, elect this electrode, which means that the electric dipole moment is pointing in the opposite direction. So when this state, so once depolarization is achieved, you back to potential zero. Now, when this wave of repolarization sweeps this cell, this uh, waveform, this waveform picked up by the electrode here is going to go in the negative direction. Okay, and you get another wave. So this C corresponds to complete depolarization. Whereas this B corresponds to half of the cell being depolarized and half of the cell being repolarized. And you can check this out that this is indeed going to be the case. All right. So this signal that is picked up will have positive humps and negative humps, depending upon whether the electric dipole moment is off the heart, which is a dynamical quantity, changing both its orientation. Oh, yeah and its magnitude, because different amounts of the tissue, different masses of the tissue are becoming polarized and depolarized. And you have electrodes placed on the chest, normally six electrodes placed on the chest, four electrodes placed on the limbs. You have 12 electrodes placed in a complete ECG uh, experiment, 12 leads, and then you are able to pick up different kinds of signals. So it's like doing a tomography of the heart, a tomography of the electric dipole moment of the heart. The heart has a macroscopic dipole moment and you're using electrodes placed on the body, which was first proposed in the 18th century by, the Eindho by Eindhoven and you're picking up signals from the electrode. Now let's have a small demonstration. I would like to have a volunteer. That was a graph, 
So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to demonstrate the ECG process. Ijazat ab. Yeah. All right. So first of all, let me introduce Dao to you. Yeah, Dao. Are we allowed to take photographs? So now what we have in front of us is this is a circuit that looks at these very small signals and amplifies them, uh, removes noise to a fair extent. And one is able to look at the bio potential at the electrical potential coming from his heart. So this is my device, the fizz logger device that is bringing those voltages into the computer. So first of all, in order to make this preparation, I would need to put three electrodes on his body. So I would like to start off by uh, applying some gel onto his elbows. First of all, this one. Yeah, thoda se pirmal lena. So this gel is allows one to make a good electrical contact between the electrodes and the body. So here is one electrode. <clears throat> so this electrode has a metal piece to it. I'm just going to connect this here. Uh, now I would need your right Ankle. Thodasa bend to per kare. Thik hai to. Just above the ankle ye thodasa. So I need to put in a reference electrode far away from the heart, which is at zero volts. The third electrode I would like to put here. So here is his heart. The heart is an electric dipole moment and it's constantly fluctuating with the heartbeat. It's growing, becoming smaller, changing its orientation. An electric voltage is being picked up between these two electrodes here with reference to the ground, a third reference terminal. So now I need to put, apply some gel over here. I put the third electrode. Now this is a very rudimentary setup here. You can do it properly with proper electronics and with sophisticated electronics. Now I'm going to start my software. So let's first move to the screen. Okay. So let's see how it goes. <laughs> you never know whether these things work at the right moment at the right time. So I initiate my FizzLogger software. So here is his ECG signal. All right, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. So why, first of all, you need to, uh, you need to believe me that this is an ECG signal. So if I remove the electrode, I get nothing. And I put it back and I recover the ECG signal. All right, so let's give, 20, 30 seconds for this waveform to develop. Here is, I'm going to zoom in into this a little bit. Here is this electric potential across two electrodes on the skin coming from his heart directly. Now this has a particular waveform, has a particular structure. 
if I zoom into this a little bit, of course, I've amplified the signal as well. So this is what the signal looks like here. This is a big, let me stop this. Signal is very weak, right? Let me check the sampling time. Try to adjust this a little bit. Lot of noise. Okay, well. Jail, jail. Jail, cut them over here. Yeah, so that's not All right. So this it's noisy, but nevertheless, this is generally called a QRS waveform very noisy. Somehow it's extremely, extremely noisy. Let me try, sorry. थोड़ा दोबारा इसको अप्लाई करें All right, so let me just uh, stop this and go back to the waveforms that we've seen already. Take a minute. I think we need to redo the placement of the electrodes once again. You can try on me, let's try on myself. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right, so here is our ECG signal, right? Slightly much better this time. So if I move this, this thing goes slightly topsy-turvy. If I remove an electrode, signal disappears. I put it back, the signal reappears. It takes some time to stabilize. All right, so let me just uh, pause this here and try to zoom in a little bit. 
All right. So if you look at this signal over here, this is what it generally looks like. Uh, you have a complex, which is called a QRS complex. This is your main signal that corresponds to ventricular contraction. It is the strongest signal generally. When the ventricle contract, it gives rise to this QRS complex and the timing of this complex, you find out the intervals between these complex, you get the heart rate. Just before this complex, there is a P wave. The P wave corresponds to contraction of the atria. The depolarization of the atria. The QRS complex corresponds to depolarization of the ventricles. This hump after the QRS complex is called the T wave. It corresponds to the, depol the repolarization of the ventricles. The repolarization of the atria is hidden, is masked by the depolarization of the ventricle. So it happens at the same time as the QRS complex. So you cannot identify this in most cases. Generally, after a T wave, there is also a U wave in the opposite direction. So this is what a general ECG waveform looks like. You put these electrodes on your chest, you will get a cleaner signal because you are closer to the heart and the signal is stronger because of the one over R cube dependence. You move away from the heart, you get a weaker signal. And when you have a weaker signal, you have to amplify it. But when you amplify it, you're also amplifying the noise. So you have noise rejection circuitry built in. So this is what a general ECG waveform looks like. And by using simple electronics, simple circuits with some clever noise cancellation, you can measure these very tiny, minute uh, ECG signals. And these signals, by the way, are of the order of microvolts, but we've amplified them to about one volt. So we have a high amplification in our circuit as well so that we can easily measure these signals. So any questions? All right, so thank you very much. Uh, we'll meet next Monday, inshallah.